So we heard from Leonard Lauder about how he is set on curing breast cancer and how he is um, innovating in Alzheimer's drug discovery. Um, Lyda Hill is combining both her philanthropy and her venture investing toward all kinds of innovations in, um, in medicine and health. Marilyn Simons is really attacking um, health and medicine from the basic science point of view and specifically targeting the disorder of autism. Um, and uh, we heard even from David Rubenstein about how he has selected over the course of his philanthropic uh, career a, a couple of different diseases to really attack. So now we're going to be focusing on um, all of the different complexities of the brain, brain research. We have the great fortune of having two great scientists, a medical doctor and a scientist on stage, as well as a, a science philanthropist, who are going to give us some of the history, as we are here in the Smithsonian Museum of American History, history context um, on the brain. And I want to begin by just uh, saying that I read a quote recently from Hippocrates, 400 BC, that he said that the brain is the seat of intelligence. So millennia ago, um, people were thinking about the brain and studying the brain and trying to figure out how the brain works. And now, mil several millennia later, we have true experts on stage who can um, give us perspective on how far we've come and what sort of frontiers we are attacking in order to um, cure and prevent some of the diseases that affect us that are brain related. So I'm gonna begin with Dr. Howard Fillett. Um, Howard is the founder of the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Fund, and he's a medical doctor at Mount Sinai in uh, gerontology and neuroscience. Howard, Thank you. tell us about uh, what you know about Alzheimer's in particular and how far it's come. Well, let me say I'm very optimistic about Alzheimer's disease today. Um, and there's a historical reason, if I may say so, we heard a lot about all the successes in cancer. Um, the Imperial Cancer Fund was started in 1902 in England. The National Cancer Institute was started in the United States in 1937. The war on cancer in the late 60s, early 70s had billions of dollars for cancer research. And now it's 30, 40 years later, it's paid off and cancer um, in large part for many cancers are chronic manageable illnesses. Now take that history and where we are today and look at Alzheimer's disease. Senility was thought to be a normal part of aging until 1970. What changed in 1970? Well, basically Alzheimer in 1906 saw a 52-year-old woman who was senile. She was demented. And he took care of her. And in those days, the doctors did their own autopsies if they were interested in research. And he took some industrial dyes that came out of the fashion industry. One was called Congo Red. And he looked under a modern microscope. Somebody had figured out how to put a light in the microscope. And he studied this lady's brain, this 52-year-old woman. And he saw the plaques and tangles for the first time. So he put together these abnormal pathologies, the plaques and tangles, with dementia in a 52-year-old woman. And he described it as Alzheimer's disease. But it was called a pre-senile dementia. From 1906 until 1970, nothing was done in research on Alzheimer's disease. 1970 was the year I started med school. What happened in 1970 was some pathologists working in London, uh, Blessed Tomlinson and Roth, did a very simple experiment. <clears throat> what they did was they looked at the brain at autopsy of about 50, 75-year-olds who died who were senile, normal part of aging and about 50, 75 year olds who died who were not senile. And they discovered that the old people, the elderly people who died who were senile, had Alzheimer's disease. So it was on that day in human history that senility went from being thought of as a normal part of aging to being recognized as a chronic, uniformly progressive, uniformly fatal neurodegenerative disease of old age. That was the year I started med school. I never heard of Alzheimer's disease in med school. It wasn't in my textbooks. When I trained in the mid-1970s in New York City, I never made the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, even though I was caring for hundreds of older people. 
Um, the National Institute on Aging was started by a Congressional Act of Congress um, in 1974, and my mentor, Robert Butler, went to the NIA in 1976 at a time when we as a country were spending billions of dollars, when billions of dollars was a lot of money, money. on heart disease and cancer, and we spent $600,000 on 12 grants nationwide for Alzheimer's. Now, I give you that historical experiment to explain my optimism, because when I started in the field and I saw my first patient in 1980, nothing was known about Alzheimer's disease. Zero. Literally zero. Um, and all I want to say, because I don't want to take a lot of time, is that in my professional lifetime, we've made incredible strides in Alzheimer's research. First of all, my soundbite would be to you that we know as much today, or I believe that we know as much today, about the causes and the biology of Alzheimer's as we do about heart disease and cancer. But because we have that staggered start of 40, 50, 60 years, we haven't translated that knowledge into new drugs. And it's been shown that it takes about 30, 35 years to translate new knowledge into new drugs. Cholesterol was discovered as a risk factor for heart disease in the 1950s. The first statins didn't come out till the 1980s, as one example. So we know a lot about the biology. Now's the time to translate that into drugs. We've done that. We have ways that our foundation helped to bring the first diagnostic test approved by the FDA to market in 2012. As a practicing clinician, geriatrician, I can see a patient that has memory loss. I can write a prescription to the radiology office to go for the PET scan that we developed that was approved by the FDA in 2012. They go down the block, and within about two hours, I can tell them with about 95% certainty whether or not they have Alzheimer's disease. That so we're going to get into okay. ADF so I'm in stop. a few minutes. Well, I'll just say that we have a lot of drugs in, in development. We have ways to diagnose the disease, and we understand a lot about prevention. So huge changes from 1906 when Dr. Alzheimer named the disease to 1970 when it became um, sort of clarified in the lab, it sounds, even though it wasn't generally known by either medical students or the population to what we will be hearing are the real frontiers that you are attacking. So let's step aside over to Steve McCarroll. Steve is at Harvard Medical School. He was originally a mathematician and computer scientist and has, has um, um, converted over to neuroscience and uh, is, is looking at um, some of the mental health issues and, and illnesses and disorders and specifically schizophrenia, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so tell us some background and history there of, of where that disorder is. Yeah, I, men, mental health illnesses such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and major depression have vexed and perplexed humans for thousands of years. And they have just profound, profound public health impact. The World Health Organization estimates that um, the, the public health impact as measured by lost years of life and work um, of, for neuropsychiatric disorders actually exceeds even that of cancer and cardiovascular illness combined. And the reason is that these are, these are really disorders that strike the young. They strike people in the, in the prime of life, often just as people are completing their educations, beginning to form families, and, um, and then, and then can, can persist in a chronic form for, for many decades, um, eclipsing a person's potential, um, you know, in, 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 in including their, their social potential and their, their potential in the world of work um, in, in so many ways. And so these illnesses have just profound, profound public health impact. And yet there's been enormous confusion, even up until recently, about just even the most basic questions about them, like how, to what, to what extent these are organic biological illnesses. I think ge human genetics has finally settled that question quite clearly by beginning to point to molecules that, that, that matter. And um, this is, a, and the study of these illnesses is entering a biological and molecular and cellular phase that in many ways is analogous to where the study of, of the, 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 
what the, the study of cancer entered into a couple of decades ago. And I think it is, when we, we look at just the amazing progress that's been made in cancer research and just the, the you know, the, we're surrounded by people who talk about once lethal illnesses in the past tense. And it's a, it's, it's a reminder of, of the extent to which in a generation, even in a decade, science can transform what it means to have a certain illness. And I think that, that these brain health disorders are, are just entering a, a similarly exciting and historical phase in our, our understanding. Thank you. So now to turn to Dagmar and to hear from the philanthropists on the stage, I want to read just an excerpt from your giving pledge letter. You said that the care of seniors with cognitive impairment, as well as advocacy and support for Alzheimer's research, has become a mission for our family. In the same vein, we are committed to lifting the veil of shame around mental illness and allowing those affected to live to their full potential. So why don't you tell us about how you and your family became interested in brain issues? Well, as I'm listening to my co-panelists, it all sounds very familiar. I yeah. had to learn everything Howard said in the last 10 years, which was when my husband, my brilliant husband, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And it, it, I didn't know anything about this disease. It's not something I wanted to know about. You right. know, who, who wants to know about horrible diseases? I had to learn it pretty quickly. And my first, you know, my first reaction, as awful, obviously, as this diagnosis was, which I was handed, of course, uh, first, um, my, my first reaction was, oh, they'll find something. You know, there's so much going on in the medical field. There'll, there'll be something. Well, I, I learned that even though the, there has been progress, um, it was slow in, in coming. And, and in fact, the, what you were saying about the, the dates, the 1970 and the 1970s, we realized that my father-in-law, my husband's father, had had it too. So undiagnosed. Nobody, nobody ever mentioned the word Alzheimer's yeah. in those days. You know, it, grandpa was senile. Right. And anyway, so that's, that's sort of the background. Um, my husband lived only for four and a half years with it because then out of the blue he he was struck with, with um, leukemia, and that took him very quickly. And so I did not actually go through all of the stages with him, but enough to want to do something about it. Well, you, you also talked about when he was first diagnosed and you were first living with it as a family, that you were coping with the stigma and, and whether to be public. And, and that's a complexity that's not um, known necessarily in other diseases. That's so right, but it would, it's true of both, yeah. whether it's mental illness in the young or, or, or this uh, dreadful disease. Um, it, yeah, it was very difficult and it took me stages after which I could open up. And lo and behold, everything became so much easier because I got nothing but support yeah. from my friends or from anybody who, who heard about it. And, but it, as much as, yes, the science is the most important path to a, a solution and a cure, I also felt that it was important to do something in the short term. And the short term was to find out what, are the, what is the care, basically? How far have we got in this? And I, with my husband's neurologist, Catherine Madison, um, I started, f f with her help, I uh, started funding a brain health center in San Francisco. 
Uh, no, is that something that existed already? Or oh, you? yes, yes. Okay. We did that in, in 2012. We opened it. And unfortunately, it has a terribly long waiting list right now, which is obviously something we have to, to work on. But it shows you the need right. for this. And um, so that, that was, I think that was one of my first steps. I also learned that the Alzheimer's Association is really a fantastic uh, group to, to deal with all parts, whether it's the science, is a fairly a good uh, size of their budget goes into, uh, into research. Um, but they also do, uh, do the, the caregiver support. They run courses, they run support groups. And so that's one of my first uh, 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 contributions and, and grants, really, that, that and, I And that's made. a really great place to go initially with a disease, is to the, the association, the national association, the local chapter because it's a good way to become informed. Uh, you also talked about going to a conference where you met a lot of people, right? I, I, you know, I went to, to the Alzheimer's International Conference, which is one of their, their very important activities where they convene uh, people from all over the world. And it, it gave me a lot, it did give me a lot of hope that mm -hmm. there were 50, this was in, it was in Paris, of course, <laughs> of all places, um, 5,500 people, uh, scientists were there. Of course, I was a little lost, you know why? <laughs> but just, just this feeling of support yeah. helped. And I think that's my enthusiasm about the philanthropy, uh, that, it makes you feel better when you actually can do something. Right. Well, so Steve, you've talked about having a wonderful experience with a philanthropist through the Broad Institute. Um, tell us about your experience with Ted Stanley and starting that center and, and what, it's, what it's doing to fundamental research. Absolutely. So the, the Stanley family, uh, Ted and Veda Stanley, became um, very uh, concerned about and engaged in uh, mental health research when their, their son, Jonathan, developed bipolar disorder in, in his 20s. And they saw the enormous gap that exists between how, how disorders of other organs are understood and treated by the medical system and the much more sort of vague, impressionistic way in, in, which, in which disorders of the brain are often fielded in the, in the medical system. And, and is that related to the stigma or just the, that oh, it, there's less known about them than kidney cancer? It, it, so it, I, think, I, think the, I think the stigma very much emerges from the lack of a practical nuts and bolts understanding okay. of what goes wrong to cause an illness. Every disorder that we have that kind of practical, as, as, as science develops that practical nuts and bolts understanding of what goes wrong at the level of cells and molecules, it transforms the way the culture talks about it. You just start to talk about it in these much more practical terms, and there's much less blaming of patients and families, right? It is easy to forget, you know, 50 years ago when we knew far less about what cancer was at a molecular level, it, there was far more stigma about it. And it was often talked about as a psychiatric condition. It was sometimes associated, it was described as being associated with repressed passions. And, and in an earlier generation, same thing with tuberculosis. It was called consumption and, and often attributed to excessive passion. And in, with each of these disorders, as they came to be understood, in specific molecular and cellular terms, the culture just started to engage them in a way that was much more practical and positive. And uh, you know, my, my, my sister struggled with cancer. Everyone she knew knew that she was struggling with an organic biological illness and saw that struggle as heroic. No one blamed her, no one blamed her family. And that's where I think science, that, that, that ability to 
reduce the stigma and allow a culture to talk about a disease in more productive terms is actually a gift that science brings years before it, it brings the cures. Okay, so, so you, you've been pursuing um, fundamental research, and that is figuring out how the mechanisms of the brain and the body connect and work and molecules and antibodies and those things. But um, when there is a discovery in the lab, then we, in the past, haven't had great vehicles to accelerate either the funding or the research in order to have cures or, or management practices, right? So Howard thinks that he's figured out the way to do it for Alzheimer's. So I want to hear about how you came up with this idea for Alzheimer's drug discovery and, and where it's taking us. Well, as I mentioned, the research sort of started around 1980. And um, around 1998, when uh, Ronald and Leonard Lauder asked me to start the foundation, at that point I had run a lab for 20 years, done a lot of basic research, but I was very frustrated by the inability to translate that research into new drugs. And the, it was a co- And why couldn't you? Well, I was in academia for one thing, and at that time almost all of the f pharmaceutical research was done in industry. Um, today it's quite different actually, and there's a lot of academic centers that can do drug discovery and development, but back then it was kind of unusual or rare. Um, but the other thing was that there was a valley of death in the financing of drug development. Um, there was a lot of new science coming out. There were a lot of new ideas. There were very few investors who were willing to take risk on these new ideas. Everybody thought that there was nothing known about the disease, which you know, historically was correct. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea of the founders of, of Ronald and Leonard was really brilliant in a way because sort of unlike the Alzheimer's Association, what they wanted to do and what we did was focus on one thing and one thing only, and it was in the incorporation papers of the private family foundation that started the whole thing, which was we were only gonna do, develop, accelerate the development of new drugs for the treatment and prevention of Alzheimer's and the development of biomarkers so that we could accelerate, but because biomarkers like cholesterol play not only an important role in early diagnosis, but in accelerating clinical trials and getting drugs to market. And the other thing that the incorporation's papers said was that we were going to adapt a vehicle called a program-related investment, which is an IRS vehicle that enables private philanthropies to invest in for-profit entities to, to advance their mission. So give us an example of what a PRI is. So a PRI um, originally came out of uh, the problem that the Ford Foundation had at a time of scandal in the 1960s when there were contractors who wanted to build uh, housing in underserved areas. And they did a tricky thing, which was they made donations to their foundation, got a tax deduction, and used the foundation to build the housing. And the IRS said, this is self-dealing. You can't do that. So the Ford Foundation said, well, you know, we support, we want to support these kind of entities, but you're blocking us from doing it. So the, the IRS said, OK, we're going to have terms for this. And the terms are going to be that the primary purpose of a nonprofit's investment in a for-profit is to first advance your charitable mission. And we'll let you get profit if it works out. If there's, if there's, so you can get a return back into the foundation. And at the time that we started, this was very unusual. I can say that since 1998, we've made over 110 investments in for-profit early stage biotech companies that never would have gotten anywhere without nonprofit money making investments in these companies. And so since then, we've seen over 6,000 ideas for new drugs for Alzheimer's. There's over 100 new drugs in, in clinical trials now for Alzheimer's, which is incredible to me because when I started, there were zero drugs in clinical trials. Um, and I might add that today. And maybe tell us how, how active the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry is in Alzheimer's? You know, the pharmaceutical industry, I, I have to applaud in a way because one clinical trial in Alzheimer's in phase three costs $400 million. And you need anywhere from two to four of these to get an FDA approval. So we're talking about somebody sitting at a desk at Pfizer or whatever and saying, I'm going to risk a billion or maybe two billion or maybe three billion on this Alzheimer's thing where we've had 100% failure rate since 2004, over 400 failed trials. And you're going to say, gee, Howard, you must be really depressed, but I'm not <laughs> because I'm, I'm so optimistic. Just like um, I think Larry Norton mentioned earlier, 
the cancer field had to learn how to do clinical trials in cancer. You put together these consortia. We're right at that stage now. We've learned how to, we have biomarkers, um, like cancer. You know, precision medicine and cancer is all based around biomarkers. That's why we've partnered with Bill Gates and the Dolby family and others um, to develop these biomarkers through the Diagnostics Accelerator that is not just for early diagnosis and clinical practice, but it's to accelerate the development of drugs. So it's a matter of, of the philanthropy being able to take risk where investors and pharma companies won't step in. The pharma companies will come in when you basically have phase two data. In other words, you've sh these small uh, struggling biotechs have been able to get through phase two or towards phase two, and they have data to show efficacy. And then maybe pharma will look at it, and then they'll take the risk on these huge, expensive programs. But how many, even Pfizer or any of the big companies, how many programs could they run when they're two, three billion dollars a piece? Not that many. So the philanthropy feeds the pipeline, yeah. and a lot of the drugs that are in clinical development now came out of the philanthropy taking risk on early stage new ideas. Just, just to amplify yeah, yeah. What, what Howard's saying, research momentum in the basic science related to an illness makes that field far more exciting and and appealing to the pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies that, that then want to develop drugs. They look at where the progress is in the basic sciences and where there's new understanding of mechanism. And then they amplify that progress with their own investments. So successful basic science traction for an illness can have an enormously catalytic effect. It can, it can, it can have the, the, the effect of, you know, follow-on investment from companies that's order of magnitudes greater than the initial investment in the basic science. So Dagmar, I want to turn to you because what we're hearing is really interesting, but it's really complicated. And so as you are deciding where your philanthropic investments or your venture investments are going, how do you, how do you learn about the science? And how do you make the decision to, to invest in, in ADADF? Well, um, we have a lot of help from people like Howard. Uh, actually, it's my son, David, mm -hmm. who has uh, taken this very seriously and has learned as much as, as a, a, a non-scientist can learn. And uh, he has found, identified probably a dozen direct research projects uh, that are of interest to us. Um, do, do you bring on science advisors? Or um, he, well, separately from our, separately from our foundation uh, granting, uh, we have started a small uh, venture fund. And for that, he has a, a very illustrious uh, advisory council. And, um, uh, and and we we partner we partner with with ADDF we partner with uh, the Global Alzheimer's uh, Platform uh, we um, let's see I guess these are the main partnerships but the the direct the direct uh, uh, grants uh, go to for instance Gladstone uh, Institute in San Francisco, which has about 10 different Alzheimer's projects going. So, you know, you actually, you can't just do one thing. And we have, I have always, in, in any of the fields that I, I have given, I uh, have tried to look at things from many different angles. And uh, so we, again, we, we, we do that, and, uh, and we have the, the dual, the, the, uh, the philanthropy area and the, the venture area. And the venture area would, would apply to small companies, uh, which a, a pharmaceutical company wouldn't even look at. And, but and, if and so one are, you, are you focusing your work around Alzheimer's or, or this a particular disease, whether it's venture or philanthropy? Or are you looking for opportunities sort of across the spectrum of different um, health issues? There are, in the, in the venture field, I think there are a couple of other health-related, but it's all health-related. And, uh, and, and it's basically, it's the, 
where you reinvest your 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 money. You know, it's it's we don't have any partners in that. This is just our own. Uh, and in the in the philanthropy field, um, I I also am very interested in uh, the uh, University of, of California, San Francisco Department of Psychiatry. And we just had a, a, a conversation we've had for the last uh, six years, I think. We've had a fantastic new chair there who has really brought the, the department up. And it's an area that, that has interested me equally, yes. So, so do you remember, as long as we have Howard, your new partner, on stage, do you remember what your early conversations were as the Dolby family was considering, you know, investing in Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Fund? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we started as a private family foundation. We built an infrastructure. We built a model. Um, by 2004, we kind of had proven the model mm -hmm. and the value and the demand that was in the scientific community around the world um, for this kind of funding and this kind of expertise. So we spun out a public charity. And the purpose of the public charity was recognizing that even the Lauder family could not do this alone. And we needed it's to partner. It's a massive problem, massive really problem. expensive. And we wanted to build a platform where others could, we could partner with the Dolby family. So what we did was we spun out a public charity. Um, I currently have eight scientists, full-time neuroscientists on staff. Every day we're mining the world for new ideas, we're doing due diligence, we're vetting projects, we're funding projects, we're contracting with biotechs, and then we follow them, we help them develop their programs because we, we're all experts in the field. And 100% of the overhead is paid for by the private foundation. So anybody who partners with us, we provide that platform as an in-kind benefit. Um, and so when the Dolby family was looking for a partner, because at the time you, you were still exploring ways that you could work most efficiently, I think. Um, because you have a small foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least in staff, I guess. In staff. Yeah. In staff. No, staff, staff, but staffing the, was. But the thing was, the idea was, why should every family foundation that's out there in every family office build the kind of infrastructure that we have um, when we would make it available to them as true partners. Uh, th that's really the thing so that we can all work together. And I think that's what, if I may say, also attracted Bill Gates and some of the others. And it's been terrific because part of the partnership here is that David, your son, and others, Pascal and the other group, they're also seeing new biotechs and ideas that we're not seeing. So we have a quarterly conference call and you tell us what you've seen and we tell you what, you, what we've seen. And, you bring a certain expertise that David and Pascal have, and we have you know, the deep science, and now you have Deanna for the first time. So it, it, the relationship is actually growing, and we've co-funded a number of companies. Um, so it, it works very well. We have a lot of partnerships like that. But I, I have to say, my, I think personally, my, my greatest contribution is talking about it. And Maybe because that did not, when I first face the problem, I didn't have anybody to talk to, you know? I, I had a couple of women friends who had gone through it, and of course, every case is different. Mm -hmm. And and so that's that became uh, very important to me to be available to, and a lot, oftentimes people sent their friends to me just to talk through it, you know, what is, uh, you know, what, what can you expect to the extent that, that I, can, I can help. But the, the education and the, and the communication uh, and the awareness building is, is hugely important. I could just, if I could just comment on that. Um, when I started in the field, I would, people would ask me what I do, and I'd say I'm working on Alzheimer's disease, and they'd look at me sort of cross-eyed and say, Alzheimer's disease? I, I never heard of Alzheimer's wow. disease. And I just, How far I, we've I'll, come. I'll never forget wow. about two or three years ago when Still Alice came out, a movie, and here it is, you know, in the, in the, in the movie theaters, right? And I'm sitting there in the back, and I'm watching a packed movie theater of people, a lot of older people, some younger people, and they're all riveted to the screen about a story about Alzheimer's disease because everyone was affected and they wanted to know about it. But we're still training doctors to recognize and bother to diagnose the disease and counsel and educate patients and their families because it takes an hour. And the average visit in primary care in the United States is eight minutes. Yeah. 
and it takes an hour, an hour and a half to even begin to counsel and people. That is indeed a whole other field to, to train the, the primary care people because they don't, they don't know enough about it. So Dagmar, you're innovating in that area. You know, we've talked about basic science, we've talked about drug discovery. As Larry Norton said, you know, you need all the different pieces of the airplane pulled together to actually fly the airplane. And you have now started thinking about patient care and what can you do um, and what sort of services are different and necessary for people with dementia or Alzheimer's or just geriatric care overall? Well, in the case of our brain health center, it's that you have sort of a one-stop shopping place, right. you know, where you don't have to go from one appointment to the next. You have it all in one place. You have the neuropsychologists who do the, the testing. You have the, the neurologist. Um, you have a pharmacologist, or a pharmacist, rather. Um, and and to some extent, well, of course, a whole department of, of social workers. So that's, I think, the best I have come up with so far. I'm sure you'll continue to innovate. And you, if I may say, from the, geriatric. well, I'm a geriatrician. Yeah. Um, it's hard to make a living as a geriatrician when you're trying to live off of Medicare and less than 3% of doctors go into geriatric medicine and the number of people that are going into geriatric medicine is actually on the decline even though our population, population is increasing. Crazy. But I think what Dagmar is doing with the Brain Health Center is fabulous because, because the economics really in many ways don't work for a clinical practice like that where you have multiple team members which you need to care for Alzheimer patients as they move through the spectrum from early stage disease all the way through the severe stages. And this is a place where philanthropy is critical to providing services for people in need. Yeah. I've also, I have funded places like, uh, um, well, the Institute on Aging in San Francisco, which is a, a daycare facility. You want to, to basically get the best practices out there. And uh, because it's, it's just horrendous. Well, you've, you've all heard these figures of, uh, uh, you know, the, the caregiver. Uh, uh, burnout right. and uh, right. yeah. Well, so given all of these issues, why isn't the federal government doing more? And and sort of what role can can philanthropy play? You know, is it a drop in the bucket? Is it really moving the needle? Steve, I know you have some opinions about this. I'd actually like to hear from all three of you on this topic. Yeah. Uh, well, the there are the federal support for biomedical research is an incredibly important part of the ecosystem. In the US. In the US. Um, you, philanthropic support has some really special roles, though, that are, can be hard to replicate in that kind of federal bureaucratic model. So one is the, just the chance to make very focused, very strategic investments at a place and time of historical opportunity. Um, you know, it tends to be the nature of these big systems to try to you know, spread things far and wide and have grants in every congressional district and, and things like that. You know, a, a philanthropic gift can be as focused and targeted as the, as the donor wants. And so that is, um, that is a, uh, a really important aspect. The, the other thing about about philanthropically funded research is that it is, um, as, as to contrasted to the federally funded system, is it, it actually can have a much longer time horizon. So the, the, t the incentives of the kind of traditional research funding systems can be a little bit short term in terms of like the next paper, the next grant. Um, with, with, with philanthropically funded science, it's, it's about the mission and it can be whatever time horizon you set out when you, when you organize the project. And, you, and, and a lot of important things in science require persistent effort over many years and don't bear fruit until several years out. And so um, to be able to create loci for that kind of persistent effort and that longer time horizon I think is something that philanthropic support is uniquely able to do. Dagmar, do you, how do you feel about philanthropy and are you looking at what the government is funding at the same time? 
Well, I think the figures of the, of the government support have already been mentioned. It's actually tremendous that we've come from the, the 500 million when I first learned about all of these things to now 2.4 billion. billion. For, for Alzheimer's in, specifically. For, for, uh, yes, yeah. for Alzheimer's research. Um, uh, that, that's fantastic, but at the same time, uh, the government, they, and they can do larger, larger projects, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's very complicated. And as a, as a private philanthropist, you can move things so much faster. You can do smaller, you can take on smaller projects, and you can be so much more nimble. Okay. And Howard, what's your take yeah, on this? Um, we work together. Um, I think government has a role a lot of the things that we take risk on help people get preliminary data. Then they can apply for government grants. And so a lot of the things we're feeding the pipeline and the science side, uh, there is $2.4 billion now in, for neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's uh, in, in the NIA budget and National Institute on Aging budget. But it's still, if you take how much money we're spending on cancer per patient per year, it's about $3,500 for cancer, for AIDS, for heart disease. We're spending about $3,500 per patient per year on research for those illnesses. And even with the $2.3 billion, dollars. when you count the number of people in the United States that are suffering from this and at risk, and it's probably more than 10 million people today and going to triple in the next three, 30 years, and while cancer deaths and heart disease deaths are going down, um, deaths from Alzheimer's disease are doubling and tripling over the next few decades, and it's going up 50%. So, and we're spending about $200 per patient per year on Alzheimer's research, uh, people suffering. So we need, we need off all of us working together. We're on, we're on consortia with industry. Uh, we provide valuable input to them. A lot of times, I mean, there's one consortium now where the, the whole FNIH, which is the foundation for National Institutes of Health, so that's now how the NIH is raising money through a foundation yeah. to help them hmm. with getting Speaking money from 20, philanthropy. 21st century models. Yeah, so, so it's public-private partnerships, yeah. and, and it, I think it's very important that all sectors of our economy work together, investors, government, philanthropy, and industry. Okay, so we are now on to our last question of the day. Um, and I want to hear from each of you what you're optimistic about on the frontiers of brain health. Steve, please wrap into your answer a little bit about your research. Sure, so, so um, the, the major part of the mission of our lab is to make visible the molecular details of how the brain is working. And how it stops working as well when it becomes ill. I feel like the major challenge in this area of research for a very long time has been that, that you know, lab animals don't get schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And you really, you ha these are fundamentally disorders of the human brain. Um, but a lot about the human brain has been inaccessible to science. It's bound up in the skull, a surgeon doesn't cut it out and hand it to a scientist the way a surgeon does with a, with a tumor. And so we believe that the, f the f fundamental way to drive progress in this field quickly is to make visible the, mo the molecular details of how the brain is working, both when it's working well and when it's not. So we develop technologies to do that. So for example, we um, developed a technology called, called DropSeq that, lets, that makes it possible to simultaneously analyze how each individual cell on a piece of brain tissue is using its genome, what genes it's using to do its job. And, and we gave this technology f freely away to the world. It's been adopted by, by thousands of labs, and it's being used by labs around the world to create an atlas of all the cells in the human body, including the brain. And all of the genes that, that each, each cell uses. So these kinds of technologies, what they, what they have in common is they turn aspects of brain function that, you, that, you, that in the past you studied by kind of one person doing one experiment on one gene over years. And instead, we create these data collection machines that simultaneously capture information about every gene and every cell and, and, 
and, and that are applicable to, to large numbers of, 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 to tissue from large numbers of, of people. And so we're trying to turn more and more aspects of brain function into a big data problem. One of the, the profound changes in our world today that's just transforming our economy is that anything that can be turned into a big data problem, the rate of change and dynamism and insight is just transformed by orders of magnitude. And we think we can do the same thing in biomedical research by developing technologies that, that, uh, that turn more and more aspects of, of brain function into the kinds of problems that can be analyzed collaboratively by biologists together with computer scientists and mathematicians and, and engineers and try to make really, really rapid progress on problems that have been frustrating for a long time. So Steve, you're optimistic about um, uh, analyzing the brain as a big data problem. I, I'm optimistic about the rate of progress today. Okay. And it's just, today it's possible, today we and others are learning about the, at the brain at a rate that's really just an order of magnitude faster than, than it used to be. And um, to, just to, to be in a lively field where ch things are changing quickly is just incredibly exciting. Howard, what are you optimistic about in a couple of sentences? <laughs> I've, I've never been more optimistic in the, in the 40 years that I've been doing this. Um, as I say, we started from nothing, and today we have diagnostic tests approved by the FDA. I think we'll have a blood test, which will totally revolutionize the field in about three years. Um, we have over 100 drugs in clinical trials, which is amazing. Um, and we've learned how to do better clinical trials. And we know a lot about prevention. Uh, we know that we can probably prevent this disease about 30% of the cases. And just to put, put the goal in perspective, the average age of onset of Alzheimer's in late, late life is about 75. And if you think about the average life expectancy is about 80, and this is a disease of old age, that if we could delay the onset of dementia from Alzheimer's by just five years, we would reduce the number of people suffering from cognitive wow. decline in late life and before they die by 50% with drugs and preventative, uh, preventative uh, interventions, which have undergone clinical trials in a multifactorial way. So we know that from actually clinical trial research that we can get to prevention. So I think the goal of reducing the number of people by 50% in the next five Huge to 10 years is, um, is, is, a, is an achievable goal. Yeah. Dagmar? Well, I would say with scientists and activists and philanthropists, <laughs> you have to be optimistic. I and uh, I, th I think that the early diagnosis is a very important, this is obviously why we, we uh, um, uh, took part in this, um, very important because, you know, here's, you always hear people say, oh, why would I want to know? I can't do anything about it anyway. Well, wrong. We're gonna figure it out. Wrong. These guys are well, and, and the earlier you find out, and you want to find out what kind of a dementia you might be dealing with, because there are some treatments that differ from one another. So with all of that, I have to be optimistic. Great. Well, you leave me optimistic, and I hope all of you leave our audience optimistic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.